I, I really don't know how to answer these questions outside of you really have to work hard. <laughs> Julia said we're not calling for the slaughter of white people yet. We have a society that is divided along racial lines. <laughs> Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm really excited to be joined by a scholar, an advocate, and someone who has fascinating perspectives on the intersection between law and politics in South Africa. He made headlines by ruffling the feathers of Ernst Roots from AFRI Forum. And that's already quite a commendable thing to do. Fesana uh, Kasboto. Advocate Gasboto, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, sis. We really appreciate your time. What did it feel like in the heat of the Dubuli Bunu case recently when you were right at the center of headlines, cross-examining Afri Forum on such a charged political matter as whether that kind of struggle song constitutes hate speech or not? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting one. Um, I mean, it's the first trial that I'd ever done. Uh, quite young at the bar, I think I was three years at the time. Wow, that was your first trial? That was my very first trial. And I was wow. only three years at the bar at the time. So, I mean, you battle with many dimensions right there. I mean, you you know, you're the level of how junior you are, uh, having to contend with procedure of, of, of trials and mm. how you cross-examine. And I mean, obviously, the fact that it was so um, racially charged as well. Um, so there was a fusion of all those things, but it certainly was satisfying at the end of it. And uh, I'm not too sure I'd do it again, but it certainly mm. was worth it. Yeah. And what was it like it being so public? Because I think sometimes for people at the bar, it's kind of like you have to present this exterior of being invulnerable in many ways but you know when when your work is before the public and people are marking your homework in yeah. public that can be quite difficult i imagine no it was i mean i'm not i'm not on social media but i certainly didn't miss a single comment of <laughs> friends and colleagues yeah. and you know my wife and people you know, just sharing what people have to say about it mm -hmm. um, uh, from social media i mean i've made a deliberate effort to to try and not involved in that or to pay much attention to it because like i say i was in the thick of it and you know it's so easy to just get sidetracked by side issues yeah i mean post that i mean obviously you, you'd appreciate uh, you know, the positive feedback that you get from it uh, sure certainly feeds you to to try even harder um, so it really was enjoyable from my perspective for sure yeah absolutely and the wider question of hate speech seems to be at the center of politics and law at the moment. Correct. To what extent does, you know, expressing a struggle song yeah. constitute hate speech? And there seems to be an interesting almost attack on people expressing themselves for racial justice on the one hand. But then on the other hand, there's like an attempt to push the apartheid flag and expand what free speech means Correct. for racial oppression. Correct. Because you know, it's an interesting question you're asking me. It's a very important question, actually. And I think it was, by and large, uh, what influenced the outcome of the judgment, that, 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 that dichotomy, if you will. Mm. And quite interestingly, we actually relied heavily on an article, a memo written for the Legal Resources Center by your alma mater. Mm. It's, it's an institution called Oxford Pro Bono Publico. Mm. They've given commentary on the initial Dubuli Bonu case because you recall it first went to court in 2011. Yes, yes. When uh, Julius was still the president of the ANC Youth League. Mm. He lost that one in the very same court. Mm. He then sang a song again quite a number of times after he formed the EFF, they sued him for the exact same thing in the mm. exact same court again. And so the question then became, what do we understand hate speech to be in 
context of politics. And what your alma mater said was, it, it, and it's a very fundamental point, and I think as we mature as a society, we must begin to understand these nuances and context because mm. it's so easy to shoot from the hip. I don't like that word, therefore it must be hate speech yeah. without necessarily understanding within the societal context within which the song is sung or the chant is being chanted. So yeah. it's a very important question. What they said there, which seems to be jurisprudence that's gaining traction. I mean, mm. the aborigines in Australia, the Australian courts have, had, have said pretty much the same thing that you must understand the dynamic of the person who's singing the song. Yeah, yeah. So if you are a white person singing Kill Blacks in a context that is undisputed, that there was effectively a genocide of the black communi community through colonialism, to a great degree apartheid as well, you can understand why that should be hate speech. You juxtapose that with the context of a black person singing Kill the Boar in a context where the singer of the song is a marginalized person. I'm, I, I don't want to use the word previously disadvantaged because I don't even know what the concept means. Because if you look at it, at least from the economic freedom fighters perspective, emancipation goes beyond gen than just not carrying your dumb buses, uh, economic money. I mean, we've got the worst Gini coefficient as a country with the most unequal society in the world. Yeah. And you look at these things and you look at them, you know, blanketly without really interrogating mm -hmm. what underpins that statement that you're the most unequal society in the world. Yeah. So then if you have that context and you have someone such as Julius Malema singing that song, you might understand him from the perspective within which he sings that song. And what he did when I led him in examination in chief was to position himself and his politics and those of the EFF by saying, it's so easy when I say kill the boar, for a white person to be up in arms about this. But what they fail to understand in context is in fact, when he was within the ANC and was the president of the ANC Youth League, when you played the clips, where he said, President Zuma, we have a socially and economically unequal society. We will give you time frames as our president to meet these deadlines and do something about it. If you don't, we'll march to your union buildings. And of course, came out that clip about, you know, go past Sentin and take the cheeses from the fridge on our way to, to the union right. buildings. And on our back, again, we'll assist ourselves with the cheese from the Sentin fridges. The point I'm simply making is once you understand him from that perspective, that is politics. And I'm not here to bid for the EFF. Mm, I'm just mm. explaining what the case was about. Sure. Once you understand him from that perspective, you then begin to understand the politics and how this is not racialized. Mm. He then says, to this day, you have black people that refer to black people that have a social standing of a sort or got financial means as umlungwam. Mm. Now, if you understand that within his context, of course, you're not referring to them as a white person in the literal sense, but what they stand for. Boers predominantly own disproportionate amounts of land and resources. They are part of that system and their face of it. And his attack on the Boers, if you will, is to that system. And that is what really the case was about. It's really interesting to me because there is this contradiction at the heart of what Afri Forum seems to be pursuing, in my view, because you look at the apartheid flag case. And there they seem to be saying, well, you know, don't be offended. This is free speech. So for the symbols of racial subjugation, we must have this expansive idea of free speech. But then, no, we get offended if we hear uh, a struggle song like the Bully Bunu, which is clearly from a certain historical context. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, don't get too offended. But now we're super offended by this other thing. And it's almost as if there's an attempt to curtail racial justice and expand the view of racial offense, yeah. especially anti-black racial offense. And that's a very dangerous thing in a country like ours where that can create and and spark. Correct. We're already sitting on, on a powder keg. We don't need to try and, you know, light, light fire, uh, light a match near gunpowder. Sure. It's an interesting point you should make because that was one of the contentious issues where Julia said we're not calling for the slot of white people yet. Now, it's so easy to then, you know, 
take it to mean what you want it to mean and then you politicize it mm. and the point is simply this it's exactly what you're saying my client's view is that if it's the analogy it gives is this you've got this balloon right? and you keep filling it with water and the pressure just keeps coming and coming you get sunflower case you get this debacle of a swimming pool in in, in bloomfontein mm. you get uh, farmers being fed to crocodiles or whatever it was mm. Mm. you've got a gene coefficient that sits where it is you've got the largest um, inequality in the country you get minimal or rather limitations in accessing the factors of production so you just keep filling this balloon the inevitable will happen how do you counter the bursting bubble you give it an outlet yeah. the least you can do is allow an anger a voice of anger as an outlet because for as long as you suppress it the pressure will build and you will not control what's going to happen that's the point he's making what should be undisputed is that we have a society mm. that is divided along racial lines we have a society where the factors of uh, production are disproportionately owned by a certain sector of the society unjustifiably so and i think that is important to to, to underscore and now once in the mm. context of that and you have this anger at this injustice by a sector of society and the little they have is a voice of anger mm. you seek to suppress that that for me is a concoction for disaster and that is precisely what julius malema is yeah. trying to bring about and there are major resources behind this attempt to curtail free speech in one context and then expand it in another context which suits effectively white south africans who want to display the apartheid flag but not here to bully to bully um sure. and the resources can't be overlooked because there seems to be a constant attempt to target certain people yeah. and then curtail their speech or at least you know put them in cases where they have to constantly spend their own resources defending yes what in my view is a perfectly legitimate exercise of free speech yeah and it's interesting you should say that you should visit our forum's website at one point what you'll find there is an invitation to donate to Afro Forum for the exclusive purpose of funding litigation against Julius Malema and the EFF. Wow. It's there. I mean, that's if you can read Afrikaans. I can't. Someone mm. assisted me with the translation. Mm. So that's what you get. And then you get resources where you can go to Fox News, for example, and you know the yeah. issues of Tucker Carlson and what he stands mm. for. Mm. You get the Afro Forum on an international platform driving that propaganda so it's definitely a well resourced machine yeah but what is important to understand and i think i should pick it back on the point you're making that there seems to be this um, disconnect between what is acceptable what is not acceptable in relation to the exact same party of the forum mm, mm. what underscores what the apartheid flag is about which is properly captured by the sca and if i'm correct they've taken the decision to the constitutional mm, court mm. they lost the flag matter issue precisely because the court accepts what that flag stands for yeah it stands for division it stands for racial uh subjugation it stands for white supremacy that is the philosophy behind it what is a song like kill the bull what's this underpinning and it's quite interesting that yeah. the expert on behalf of Afro Forum could not tell us what the underpinning of the song was. Mm. But what it is about, and this article I'm telling you about underscores that point that ultimately you get people who have no access to no other means other than their voice and being able to chant and express their frustration. Yeah. If you want to express your frustration and you want to control and express my frustration, of what worth is it? I accept readily and I'll concede this for the first time, and hopefully the EFF continues to give me work. Mm. But I'll accept <laughs> this for the moment. It is not something you want to hear as a white person. Mm. I readily accept sure, it. Sure. But the question yeah. is, if you're going to argue it's hate speech, yeah. then you must be able to sustain the claim. 
Mm. And what we are grateful for is that our courts seem to understand these nuances I'm making reference to. Yeah. Because the same Julius Malema, the same EFF, were exonerated in the Godan matter, where Godan claimed that when Julius says, we're going to beat you until the owners come out. They understand that speech to be what it is, which is why they upheld his defense, similarly in Kill the Boy case. But what you then find is what one at face of it would say, well, then it's inconsistency because, well, if you can say kill the poor, surely you should be allowed to say, well, I'm going to flag my flag as I please. Mm. Again, courts are not lay people. And that's the unfortunate part, if you will, that questions of law, questions of law, they, yeah. they're beyond lay understanding. So you can understand the contestations within society about at the face of it, well, surely if you can say kill the boy, you should be allowed to flag my flag. But it's a question of law. And mm -hmm. thankfully, we still have a jurisprudence and judicial system that understands those dynamics and nuances. Advocate Defo um, of the Senzo Meiwa trial fame, you are the person who's responsible for his disbarring well, not the really. The LPC was. Yeah, I you, wasn't. You I was just acting on the you represented. <laughs> you represented the LPC. And Correct. it's an important point because we shouldn't uh, conflate advocates with the clients they represent. Yeah. But, um, wow, what, 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 was, what was that like? And what, to the extent that you can talk about it, yeah. what, were, what are some of the politics that are at play? Because, of course, there's this question of a black advocate now no longer being able to ply his trade Correct. but at the same time it's like we can't just give everyone a pass because of you know some kind of historical solidarity like there are transgressions that there's no point in trying to defend so what was it like representing the lpc in a case like that where on the one hand you have a fellow black professional at the bar but on the other hand there are actual allegations of serious transgressions. Funny story is an anecdote to my answer to that. My attorney yeah. who was instructed by the LPC gave me a call. I've been doing work with him on other matters. Yeah. He gives me a call and he says, the LPC wants to disbar uh, Devo. Mm. I say, okay. And he says to me, are you available to act on the matter? It's, it's probably going to go to court on these days. Yeah. I say, yeah, sure. And then I start looking up on the internet before I receive the actual brief on what the dynamics and the mm. issues are. Mm -hmm. And then um, he, he then calls me to arrange to drop off the brief. And I say to him, we've got a really difficult case here. Hmm. Um, how are we going to defend this guy? Have you consulted with him? Do you know what his defense is? Mm. He says to me, what do you mean? I say, well, it looks like the LPC has got a strong case. It says, we are for the LPC. <laughs> so I actually misunderstood yeah. him to yeah. be saying I'm acting for a default. So the sure. point I'm simply making yeah. is I was prepared to act for default because Absolutely. we've got this concept that's called the cap rank rule. Yeah. So unless there are these exceptional instances where you can't act for a particular client, they Absolutely. didn't exist in relation to default. So I had to take on the matter regardless yeah. of what I thought yeah. of the merits of it. Absolutely. And you're fully within your rights to no, do that. No, correct. No, correct. So then I, I act for the LPC mm. against him. Mm. And it's quite interesting. And, 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 and I don't know how this happens, but my chamber, so I've got this whiteboard that I've got and I've got a list of my running matters because I've got really mm. poor memory. So I just <laughs> put notes and dates as reminders. Yeah. The one time I come into my chambers, you've got the words WTF next to the word default versus the LPC or the LPC versus default. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously you get people that are not too happy about the fact that I'm acting against default yeah. or the LPC. And yeah. then in some instances <laughs> you bump into colleagues and they call you out on it. Mm, interesting. It's, it's, it is interesting. And it, it, I think it comes from a misinformed position because yeah. people still take the view that default struck off the role because of his conduct at Senzo was sure. at Senzo trial. When in fact the application against him came somewhere around 2020 okay. way before the commencement of the interesting i saw there were like over 70 Correct. complaints or something and see, and see that's the problem yeah and you look at the nature of these complaints mm. so his practice is a practice he's a former cop himself so oh, he okay. then joined or rather became an advocate yeah. and started acting against the saps on behalf of people that are you know 
uh, fired by the SAPS and right. so on. And you get these people using their pension money because they're now fired with their savings mm. to source his legal services so that he can represent them in a court of law. Sure. And what does he do? At least that was our claim before court, which was accepted. Yeah. He then mismanages his funds. He doesn't mm. produce the work. He basically steals the money if you use blunt terminology mm. and there's fraudulent misconduct and what have you. So then the real question becomes if we're then going to bring it into the politics of it, you know, the racial politics yeah. of it, you then must ask yourself the question, because he's a public figure, you then support him purely because he's black. Mm. But at what expense? Suppose the LPC didn't act against him. What would have been the consequence of that? Because as we currently stand, you've got clients whose money is here took without representing them being yeah. re returned to him. So you've got marginalized people who have either reached retirement or they've been fired and they don't have any other resources they little they have, they're asking you to assist and you fail to. So that to me gives me that comfort. Not mm -hmm. that it should be a consideration whether you're black or white before I act on behalf of a client. I mean, I've acted for clients who are on the other spectrum of sure. things. Sure. And so for me, um, that to me is the answer to that. I mean, I can't take it beyond that. All the LPC mm -hmm. did, it was in me, it was the LPC. Yeah. All the LPC did was to do what it is required in law to do, which is to protect the public against errant mm -hmm. advocates. And that is precisely what the LPC did. We had an interesting conversation with advocates Kakane on, on the channel. And we were talking about the cab rank rule, this idea that, you know, advocates represent people who come to them with problems and don't discriminate against clients by saying, I don't like you or you're too controversial for me. And that's any judicial and justice system worth itself requires that, let alone allows it. But one thing he said was that he found that in the public there is an inconsistency to the extent that often white advocates are allowed to represent whoever they want from far right-wing apartheid extremists to corporate interests. Mm. But the instant that a black advocate represents a controversial political client, people then often make the assumption that somehow the black advocate is now pushing their own political cause Correct. by representing that client. Is that something that you've you've felt and experienced a kind of double standard when people are talking about the clients that advocates represent? Correct. I mean, it's 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 well known within the uh, advocacy space that that's mm. what happened. Mm. Um, funny enough, people were well, people were making comments about. Um, I dare say a Dalim Bofu represented mm. Nandipa Makudumana, for example. Oh, imagine. Imagine what would have happened then. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, whether exactly. there's merit to it or there's no merit to it, yeah. it is a perception that is there. Yeah. I mean, no one is going to come to you and say, I'm judging you on a basis of, but, you know, it is what it is. Absolutely. Um, I, I have personally not have. Mm. Um, mm. Primarily because, in as much as, you know, there's some of the cases that, yeah, you would have seen in the news or whatever yeah so happened to have a public law interest i've been fairly insulated from that mm. area of of practice i do more of the corporate stuff because i was a corporate lawyer yeah um but be that as it may there's no doubt about it that that is what happens mm. uh, within the space and it is quite interesting because the cap rank rule is a rule that applies to all uh, professionals within the bar as a matter of fact it's enforced by the very people who mm -hmm. then come back and judge you for the mm -hmm. exact same application of the same principle yeah i mean it's quite it's quite interesting really when you look at you know the race dynamics of different council representing certain people mm -hmm. and there's less said about it than when it happens vice versa absolutely it's certainly something that happens and i'll be quite frank that it's not something that i would really yeah. had to contend with except for this one instance mm. of default which really is not a race dynamic issue yeah. more than it is being about how can you as a black brother yeah well watching your rise within the bar i suspect <laughs> just wait <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but can we also talk about your journey through the law a lot of people watching this channel are fascinated by the law and politics and the intersection there yeah but before we get to things about about the constitution and all of that, just the personal stuff. Um, the study of law, how did you come to be interested in studying law? 
and any advice that you can give for people currently studying law yeah to actually not just start but make it through your your llb tell us about your your journey to studying the discipline i studied law because i was bad at math <laughs> you need certain marks for certain disciplines um, <laughs> and and i eventually came to the law school because there was someone who, who I looked up to. And that was here at Vits, eh? That was here at Vits. I studied here at Vits. Yeah. My grandmother, funny enough, and this is the first time you're going to hear about it, but mm. uh, your father has heard about it because I remind him all the time. Mm. We're the same group, Dumanogo. Yeah. And my grandmother says to me, um, have you reached Alimpofu level yet? Have you reached Alimpofu level yet? <laughs> really? Because he was my idol growing up. Wow. Um, and, and I've always, I mean, he was the only real black advocate, yeah. wasn't he? <laughs> For well, the longest time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, with respect to all the other ones, they were at least <laughs> not as prominent as he was because he had the stint at the SABC and what have you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so my grandmother to this day keeps reminding That's me about. That's so cool. And, and, and I still have a picture of him. I should have brought it with actually yeah. when we had our um, LLB final year celebration. He was there and it was mm. the keynote speaker. So it was really a surreal moment for nice. me. So that was my real introduction to law, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And then over time, I eventually made it to this university. Hashtag Dali Mbofu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck now cleaning your image about you inviting people of a yeah. certain inclination. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've given up on that one. <laughs> so so um, that, that was the start of my law journey, if you will. Mm. And then I, I, I'm not even joking about being poor at math because I really wanted to do yeah. economics when I started off. Interesting. Um, and then I ended up not coming to vets. And then I went back home mm. um, in the Transgar, which is where I'm from. Mm. And mm. then I redid my metric, not have you, hmm. only to learn that if you have a certain age threshold, then you get what they call age exemption, whatever it is. And that's the only way I got into vets. Hmm. Um, and for me, the answer is this. And, and, and this is really important, I think. As with anything in life, it's really interesting what levels you can get to if you really apply yourself. It's really with anything in life. Mm. I mean, it's 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 mantra. It's 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 cliche. It's what people always say. Work hard. It it really is that simple, because um, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, I mean, Tembega is a sure. clear example of this, um, of being from a certain or at least his schooling years, uh, tertiary level. Mm. You've got preconceived notions of the quality of people they produce there. And then you get someone from the former trans guy came to the university, there's an expectation of what happens. And then you pass this thing with, uh, you pass this thing cum laude. And then you go to the next level, you do post-graduation, post-grad, post-graduate degrees, or yeah. qualifications, cum laude. And then you get into a good space such as EMS, for example, and so on and so on. It goes, you go to the bar and it starts happening. Mm. There's really no magic to it. I've come to understand it's not so much of your mental abilities. I mean, you can't eat it about and eat it about things. But yeah. once you really apply yourself, and really that's my answer because people mm. always ask me, mm. how do you, how do you? I really don't know how you do it outside of really yeah. applying yourself, particularly if you do something that you really enjoy, because that's a trip to life, isn't it? Mm. Finding what you actually enjoy um, and applying yourself to it. I really have no other answer yeah. to that, because I think that's how I did it. I think that's how most people do it. It's certainly the easiest way of doing it. It's a really interesting point, and it's fascinating to, he to hear that story, because when I saw you up there cross-examining Ernst Roots, like, you were young at the bar, but you had really in many ways, you know, you were in command. You were you were in many ways mastering the craft of advocacy. And one wouldn't have thought that the educational journey involved even redoing matric at an earlier phase. And it's 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 quite interesting to remind oneself that the early stages in one's academic life are, you know, don't necessarily have to have a bearing. I was the same, you know. Um now people know that I went to Oxford and you all of that on a scholarship. Nice about it, no, hey. About it. <laughs> yeah, okay, I didn't. <laughs> I, <tough. laughs> I, I didn't uh, re redo no, my sure. trick for sure. No, sure. But as an undergrad, I wasn't. I wasn't shooting the lights out, or there were some courses that I even wrote subs for. One course I failed. But something clicks if you keep at it long enough, and then you're like, ah, 
So I think sometimes people are like, all these people who have succeeded or who, who are up there in their professions or, or what have you, must have been brilliant all along. They must have been as brilliant as they are now. I'm not brilliant now, therefore I won't get brilliant. Um, but wow, it's, it's really interesting to hear that side of your story because I would never have, have guessed it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in terms of the craft of, of advocacy, I was very interested by your cross. I can't believe that was your first trial. Um, it still is my only trial. Really? Yeah. 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 How did you prepare for the, for the cross examination? Yeah. Um, especially the famous one of Ernst Roots and t take us into some of your craft and how you prepare for cross examination. Cause that's a whole world on itself and everyone has a different way of doing it. Yeah. How do you do it? And how did you do it then? Sure. Um, I, I really don't know how to answer these questions outside of you really have to work hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which is what I did. Um, it's an interesting story, actually, because how I even became involved in the matter. Uh, what a funny story. Mm. Um, there was uh, the, the, the Godan trial that I told you about. Um, Tembega was for uh, Julius mm. Uh, mm. against Godan. And a colleague of mine came to me and said, there's this interesting case, you're still young at the bar. Um, it's a hate speech matter. It's non paying pro bono. You want to be a friend of the court, mm. make submissions on freedom of expression. And, you know, it's something exciting, high profile. Sure. Case, so I take it on. Julius at the time was in England mm. watching the trial. Uh, no, it wasn't a trial, it was a motion. Um, he then comes back and not long after, I hear this bustling voice on my phone. Hello, advocate. Uh, it's Julius. <laughs> Can I come see you? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, did he dial the right number? I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. He yeah, comes. Yeah. And hey, he that's quite me, a call to get. <laughs> yeah. He gives me a whole host of cases. First time I ever met the guy. Because typically what you do is you go through attorneys and mm, mm. You brief through attorneys. And, and he comes to my chambers and we have a chat about this. And one of the matters that he gave me was this one. Yeah. I was out of my depth by a mile. Mm, I've mm. never done trials, let alone having to leave myself in such a high profile matter. The point I'm making is that yeah. I had all this time because eventually I was heard last year, was it? Yeah. In fact, yeah. sometime. Yeah. And since I think my second year, third year, I'd been working on the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not exclusively, obviously, because I've got other work, but I had the benefit of that entire time Interesting. to do research on this. I mean, Typically, as an advocate, what you need to do is work on the facts that you have because you've got the basics of law. Yeah. I, on the other hand, did not even, I wasn't certain whether, you know, it's 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 all the witnesses for the side examination in chief and then when they're done, all of them cross-examination mm. or is it <laughs> is it in chief then cross? I, yeah. I didn't even have those basics. Sure, so I sure. worked on it throughout. Mm. So then, I mean, what tends to happen when you apply yourself and you work that hard is that things tend to work out. I really don't know how else to answer mm. it outside of the mm. context. And and this is really what I'm saying to any aspirant advocate or yeah. anyone for that matter. If you really want to do it, there's no magic to it outside sure. of just applying yourself. So I've heard these two like contending theories yeah. of one being you you almost map out like what the question will be, but then also what the response to the question would be, and then what your response to that re response would be. Yeah. And then there's another one which is more like you allow things to unfold and if you know the case well enough you'll know the right question to answer uh, to ask correct um which one of those kind of did you did you fall back on like did you have like a, <laughs> a, a scenario if he says yeah. this or or were you more like as long as i know the case then i'll know what the appropriate follow-up will be correct it's an interesting one yeah because if you're that junior as yeah. i was and i still am yeah what you want to do is be safe have sure, your questions sure. set out yeah. so you really don't fumble. Yeah. The downside to that is you then get caught out in trying to get through the questions. You're not even listening to an answer, mm. which is probably giving you what you want because you're expecting what the answer is based on what their papers say. You yeah. then miss the crux of what you want to get to. Yeah. What you typically do now, which is what I do now, and it was, in fact, the fusion of the two at a list of questions. But ultimately, you mm. want to have at the end of the day, this is the answer I want. 
Right, right. So now, so you work back from that. Correct. Interesting. You Very build interesting. to this is what I want to to say ultimately. Mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. him to say. I'm not an expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was as simple as you say I'm not an expert, yeah, but yeah. it's good enough. You say you say to me, yes, I'm the complainant. At the same time, I'm giving expert witness on my own complaint. Sure. So ultimately, that's what you're trying to build towards. So yeah. I had a mixture of the two, and I realized early on in my examinations that there is no utility in going through the questions because it could well be that he's going to give you an answer that doesn't even flow with your list of questions. Yeah. And very early on, I realized that ultimately I want him to get to say this. Mm-hmm. And how mm-hmm. how you focus on just that allows you to actually listen to what they say. Sure. And to the extent they give, I mean, one of the witnesses, for example, just out of nowhere. I mean, I was building to where I wanted to go, and this is the difficulty, and this is rather the downside to having a list of questions. Yeah. I put it to her that on the version of what you said in examination in chief, this was a robbery. Now you'd expect because she's called by Afro Forum, she's going to say no. Yeah, so then you sure. must have a second question and build up to it. Yeah. She says to me, uh, well, actually, yes, it was robbery because they had this misconception that we've got money in our house. So now if I'm focused wow, on the question, yeah. I'm really listening to what she's saying, that's yeah. flying over my head. Mm. So that's my mm. advice going forward. Uh, just have what you want to get to and actually listen. Yeah. You know, this is the lesson really that we tend to miss most often as, mm. as cross examiners that you actually listen to the answer. Yeah. It might drive you in a completely different direction. You might get the answer that you still want to build to eventually, but it came five minutes ago in your examination. That's that's interesting. It it reminds me of actually debate. Actually media interviews. Oh okay. Because especially politicians will often be like, I want to know all the questions you're going to ask all of them in detail, right? Not just like, what are the areas we're going to cover? Yeah. And I'm like, well, that depends on what you say, (laughs) because I don't know what you're going to say. So I can't tell you what I'm going to ask. Sure. And the more interviews I've done, the more I've realized that you can't plan a conversation, even a conversation, let alone a cross-examination perfectly, because it's a chaotic and dynamic system where you can't predict the outcome. Correct. So you you have to have a direction, but you have to be willing to like, if, if a guest says something really interesting and then the audience is like, Whoa, I want to hear more. And then the question is just like, anyway, let's go on to the next topic. Then, then (laughs) you've, yeah, you failed. So I hear you, I hear you on that. And I didn't link the two together, but they're actually quite similar enterprises. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Did you watch advocates that you particularly learn from? Did you watch any cross examinations before that kind of gave you a rubric? Um, how did you How did you learn so fast? I guess that's what I'm I'm interested in. Because like yeah. first trial and you're cross examining like it ain't a thing. Yeah, I still do actually. I still yeah. watch uh, cross examinations. I still attend seminars yeah. on running a trial and just for the benefit of whoever is watching not familiar with the concept of what a trial is compared to what i typically do which is motion yeah trial involves witnesses where you actually ask them you know the fun stuff like the sense of me on trial that's yeah. a trial yeah Motion, on the other hand, is what people are actually more familiar with than trials, where just lawyers talk based on what the papers said. Sure. So I typically do that type of stuff. Because one, I really you know get tired really quickly. I just can't sustain being caught for five straight days. Yeah. Typically with trials, it's even longer than that. So I prefer the motion stuff, where you prepare everything in advance. You're standing there. You know, you're not under the spot to ask the right questions and mm. what have you. So that's what I typically do. But I still watch seminars around trials uh, and i'm pretty sure i'm going to do a trials again sometime mm-hmm. um i still watch watch motion proceedings i mean of all the cases that are doing the rounds now i literally make it a point to watch in each and every one of them because it's interesting thing. learn within the space you pick mm. up stuff that you shouldn't be doing because mm-hmm. it's so mm-hmm. easy to miss stuff that you're doing when you're in court yeah in contrast to when someone else is doing it i wish i could get to a point where i actually watch myself mm, uh, mm. perhaps i could learn a couple of things that i would have missed if yeah. i were to go back to that trial for example i just can't get myself to watch it yeah but it's nice to watch other professionals you know 
uh, applying their trade and there's a lot you really really learn from it so it was the same for me i literally googled how to cross exam yeah and then you get material from ju different jurisdictions yeah i mean i thought uh camila vasquez in the amber head versus johnny depp metal mm -hmm. was brilliant i mean yeah very more dramatic the more suit style where you just sure. get interject yeah uh, interruptions and objections yeah we, we're more we're calmer than that but just the technique of how to get people to say what you want you to say yeah so i still take time out to watch those things and a large part of me preparing for this trial was less on what the merits are mm. but more on what i ought to do from a technical point of view yeah let's let's come on to the constitution um, and we've had a long running debate, an interesting conversation on this channel around the constitution, its transformative potential, its radicalness or lack of radicalness. Uh, we've had advocate Mugai Tobi on the, on the channel who's you know mounted a spirited defense, not only of the constitution, but of section 25 itself. Yeah. Advocates Kakane says it must be rewritten, throw yeah. the whole thing out. Yeah. The foundation is just broken. Yeah. What's your view on the transformative potential of the constitution? Yeah. Um, and where do you sit on the spectrum of it's the most perfect document ever written in the history of humanity to throw it in the bin and rewrite the whole thing? Sure, it's an interesting question because it involves a lot of politics, um, mm. ultimately, and, and uh, to, to quite frank, I'd rather shy away from that. Mm. But just as a general remark, what constitutions are reflections of aspirations and, you know, ethos of the times? If that document seeks to represent the aspirations of the people it governs surely it must reflect when I mean, you go back to the basics and the foundations of what society is and what government is it's a social contract is it not at least that's what socrates tells sure. us it, it is what that in essence means and i'm sorry to bore you with this but i really must do it mm. typically in the communities back in the day you had five people at most they would constitute the legislature they would constitute the judiciary they would constitute the executive sure. they governed in practical terms the affairs of their societies you then have this expansion over time mm. and what you begin then to have is the impracticality of the entire south african meeting to decide its laws yeah but the principle which is foundational to that is that what people are subjected to must be as per their will so then if you get discontent at least that's the logic that follows at least as i said yeah is that to the extent then there's a disconnect between the aspirations of the community who typically would have been writing in literal terms mm, the constitution mm. once there's a disconnect between what the constitution provides for and what these people aspire for and what they want the society to be then of course then it can't be a valid document can it now when you deal with the question of section 25 and it's, it's a thorny issue mm. and it's quite interesting i didn't watch the the, the interview you would have had with Tembega, he gave yeah. a judgment, and I think that's what he would have been relying on, where he says, Section 25 provides for, in the right circumstances, the compensation could be zero, just as a matter of principle. Mm. And in fact, I think that's what he found in that particular judgment, where he said the compensation must be revised and to be corrected. But the premise was that under the right circumstances, Section 25 says compensation can be zero. Sure. I think the conceptual difficulty with that is it's an exception to the rule rather mm -hmm. than the rule. Mm. Because the other side of the political debate is we want that as a default position. Yeah. Right? So without having to justify and having to litigate and have a judge tell you in these circumstances how much would you have spent. Because by and large, people are claiming their portions of land that they were dispossessed of, ancestral land, or have you don't have resources to litigate over. To constitutional court for the yeah. constitutional court to say in these circumstances don't pay anything yeah they want as a default position and i think that's the cleavage between the two sides of the debate mm -hmm. i rather really didn't give my personal opinion on it but i can understand both sides of the debate yeah and ultimately what you must boil down to is what are the aspirations of the community of the time and to the extent the constitution doesn't reflect them mm. then it can't be a valid document i think to, to me there's a lot of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in the debate. And it feels to me that I think I'm I'm in an intermediate position. And, you know, I just will see how you respond to this. But I, I'm really reluctant to accept the what I call the triumphalist position, which is basically 
this document is perfect. Like, yes, maybe we need to tinker with the margins here and there, but we got it right the first time, basically. And then there's the view, throw the entire thing away. And I think my my view on it anyway is, is it maybe time for constitutional updating to to take stock and say, you know what, actually it turns out section one, maybe there's some changes there. Section two, actually for the most part, we're happy there. Section three, again, there's a change there. Yeah. So is it maybe a, a moment in our in our country's history where a renewal is necessary, a constitutional renewal is necessary to consolidate important gains on the one hand, which we can't deny exist. You know, that yes. the constitution actually has ushered in really important changes, but also to transcend yeah. some of the limitations. And I, that's where I am with it at the moment. No, it's fair enough. And and you join me to political commentary, which I'm really careful not to go into. <laughs> Perhaps you should invite Prince Marcello to give his views on that. Well, I already, I already anyway. have. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, wasn't, I was in charge at the time. So, yeah, he came so maybe, maybe he can give you the political perspective. I come yeah. from it from a legal perspective. Mm. If I'm faced with a dispute and an issue is a bill of rights, I argued yeah. on the basis of what my client's case is about. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, I am interested naturally in, in, in politics and the political dimension of the Constitution because mm. we tend to see the Constitution as a legal document yeah. that is for the sole preserve of a debate between intellectuals and scholars of law. It is not. It's a political document. It's a sure. foundation. Um, in fact, I suggest that secondary to it being a political document is it being a legal document. So the one comes before the other. Mm. Mm. Um, so certainly it's a political document and it requires political engagement to an extent. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's sort of a profession where, you know, these things tend to come and bite you later in the year, or later <laughs> in your career. Yeah, sure. It's happened to me in real life. Really? I used to, I used to give a lot of media interviews and lo and mm. behold, the same people I write about knock on my door to assist them with cases. So it could well be that there's a debate around Section yeah. 25 at some point. I really didn't give a definitive position on what I think about 25. No, that's fair and interesting because it's also yeah. about the constraints that are placed on advocates Correct. who have to be able to represent clients and and not have those clients feel that they've taken a position against them but at the same time we in the public domain Correct. want our best legal minds to give us some um some wisdom and insight from their practice correct um you know for me it's not even just so much about the text or even section 25 but yeah in my own kind of early studies of, of law now, it's it's also the difference between the text itself and then the jurisprudence that comes from that text. And I think in the public debate, sometimes people mix up the two, like the constitutional court will release a judgment that they don't like. Yeah. And then they'll say, well, the constitution is broken. Yeah. And I think for 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 the public, understanding the difference between those two is is also quite important like there's the constitutional court correct there's constitutional judgments that come from that court and there's the constitution and you correct. might have a problem with one correct. and not the other correct i mean isn't that how it should work generally that the constitutional court must reflect what the constitution says sure i mean there are obviously debates around whether the, uh, judges in that court or any court for the matter reflect what the constitution requires again mm. it's a political debate it's a debate around you know whether the judiciary is captured or not i i have a view on it i won't, I won't tell you what my view is yeah but the point is simply that um you want that in an ideal society and if it falls back to what i said earlier on because if you have a problem with the constitutional court judgment which reflect what the constitution says that to me says, as a civil society, you must then, as a starting point, start looking at um, amending the constitution, mm. if you will. Mm. Because, I mean, you can't you can't really take issue with a constitutional court judgment that merely reflects what, if you will, the people agreed to, yeah. i.e. through the contest and negotiations, um, the promulgation of the constitution itself through legal, legally, 
the democratic-led representative in the legislature. And to me, that's that's what it is. Um, does it require an amendment? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But to the extent people think that it should be amended because it does not carry the aspirations or it entrenches the status quo prior to 1990, 1993, and the problem is a specific provision within Section 25, of course, then the function of the representatives who represent those people must then take it upon themselves to correct that. But it can't be fair to then say simply because this judgment came out, this is the view of the judges. I mean, I have serious confidence in our constitutional right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not talking individuals, I'm talking sure, the institution sure. itself. Mm -hmm. And unless there's something empirical that suggests that, you know, something untoward is happening, we are bound because that's what we signed up to with the social contract of will be governed by democratically elected representatives, including judges and other branches of government. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And we, we can't deny just on the constitutional court, when we look at what the executive has put us through and the legislature, Sure. maybe the last place we should be looking for massive critique is the one institution that has, with all its eccentricities sure. and mistakes, actually held up for a long, a long time. Correct. Um, so perhaps to, to round off, um, the bar as an institution, you've been there since 2018 now. What have your experiences of the bar been? Has it, has it conformed with your expectations? Many people say it's, it's a place that's hostile to, to black professionals, to women professionals. Um, but at the same time, it feels like there's a new generation coming through now who have their own experiences that may not accord with the, the previous generation of black and women advocates. What's, what's your sense of, of the bar at the moment for, for those who aspire to go there one day? Look, the bar is with any other space is a space you want to be in because you want to be there and you're passionate about it the starting point and what seems and what tends to happen at least has been in my experience is that despite you know what may seem not so attractive to you if, if mm. that's where you feel you should be and that's your passion things tend to work out mm. inadvertently mm. what is clear and i think if we honest ourselves as a profession is that there's a long way to go in terms of transformation there's no doubt about it mm. I mean, let me give you a superficial example. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a superficial example for purposes of illustration, but there's more to it, obviously. Mm, mm. Of all the high-profile cases you've seen in TV, how many were led by a black female? Mm. That's no coincidence. Yeah. It doesn't just so happen. How does it happen? Clients and attorneys choose who leads what matters. Mm, mm. Of the high-profile commercial cases, how many were led by a black female? Like me, mm. that's no coincidence. Of the number of times you've watched cases in court where there's a white person involved, how many times was it a black person leading a white person in yeah. contrast to a black person leading a white person? Sure. That's no coincidence. These are decisions that are taken by individuals. The question must be why do they take them either than their perception of who's more qualified than the other mm. purely on the basis of their gender orientation I mean, that's mm. not just the, mm. the lunacy of the concept that yeah. simply because <laughs> this is your sexual disposition it must follow that mm. anyway that's just yeah. the lunacy yeah. of what you're dealing with yeah similarly simply because you've got a certain pigmentation it must be that your counterpart must be i mean i don't know if there's mm. studies to these things tell us but mm, mm. As, as i understand it there's just no merit to either so the, those yeah. are the real empirical evidence-based challenges that yeah. are faced yeah. um, by certain demographics at the bar and if if if, if 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 the bar is honest with itself it will readily accept that mm, mm. and i mean whether it's an entrenched system or whether it's individuals within the system yeah. part of the matter is that's the consequence of what it is but you're still making that paper right <laughs> Just tell us, tell us, is it good? Is it good? Is life good at the bar? You know? <laughs> How many questions did you see? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, no, no comment. <laughs> yeah, 
I really no, appreciate yeah. her, her, uh, you having this. No, of course, of course. You're Best doing great it's... work here and onward and upward. No, absolutely. It's it's a great pleasure. And um, yeah, as I say, I, I watched the the Afri Forum case with with much interest, and uh, it was great to see yet another brilliant black advocate just pushing the frontiers of the craft of advocacy. So long may it continue and all the best for your career. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Susan, for having me. Thank you. Aye, aye.